I don't want to waste words um, and hand the microphone over to Christian Gwatter. Thank you. Um, let's start by uh, saying the premise that I'm sure everybody here agrees on, that we all have secrets. Right? They're business and trade secrets, political opinions, and of course illegal activities. And in this context, I like to refer to the example of you maybe saying something about the time king of Thailand that may not be nice. And if you do so, that's illegal now. And maybe if you see, say something nice about him, that will be illegal in 30 years. Um, so watch what you say if you want to never do anything illegal. So we'd rather keep these things sometimes secret. Now, how do we keep things secret online? Well, baseline, as we all know, is encrypted. And the uh, next best thing that's used these days is, of course, to hide the metadata, so who is talking to whom. And I'm sure uh, you can ask Jake uh, more about that later. Uh, and we all know what's the practice today. Uh, it's pretty much, you know, send everything to the United States in plain text. Now, that was kind of okay until we heard that, you know, the NSA likes to look at that data. Big surprise. Uh, and the companies were willing uh, to give it to the NSA. And of course, uh, they looked at it in real time, at the historic data, and at pretty much everything they could get their hands on. And we learned that this was only a tiny part of what they were doing. Again, to some of us, not such a big surprise. Uh, when the US found out, well, they mostly discussed that this was a problem for their citizens. Uh, who here is a US citizen, except for Jake? Okay, so they didn't care about you. Now, the rest of us still would like to have some privacy left, right? Um, now how bad is it? Well, we know that uh, they, collect, uh, they, uh, they collected 2.3 billion records in the US and 97 billion records worldwide in one month. So, small collection. Uh, we know that they like to collect data in Germany because that's where they collected most of the data in Europe. Uh, but there's good news, uh, especially for Richard, they were using free software for this. <laughs> And maybe we can do something about that. Now, where were they collecting data? Well, the, today, uh, the slide you might have seen already, right? They have their collection services everywhere. And uh, Jake characterized it very nicely yesterday, saying that's effectively Google for a global TCP dump, right? We can't get all the data to the NSA, so we just find it wherever it is and make it indexed uh, and searchable and, uh, well, and look at everything there is. Now, what's this data being used for? Well, uh, one thing to keep in mind is there was this little thing uh, called the war in Iraq, where they specifically spied on United uh, States, uh, United Nations Security Council members to convince them that the Iraq war was a good idea. And so they were spying on diplomats to create a war, or create support for a war. So this is pretty serious, I would say. And it goes further. We now know that the United States has a policy of cyber war. And this is, in some sense, for me, one of the most significant revelations. Uh, and it hasn't gotten that much press compared to the others. Uh, so let's look at this really. Effective, offensive cyber effect operations can offer unique and unconventional capabilities to advance US national objectives around the world with little or no warning to the adversary or target and with potential effects ranging from subtle to severely damaging. The United States government shall identify potential targets of national importance where OCO can offer favorable balance of effectiveness and risk compared with other instruments. Now, if you read this, it's very clear. This is not about national security, it's national objectives. So national objectives include things like economic well-being, right? Or maybe being re-elected president. And so, they are developing capabilities to infiltrate our computers, exploits, listening in our conversations for national objectives. Now, one way to interpret this is to look at, you know, say, um, insider trading on stock markets. That's the ultimate insider, right? It's a very new way of thinking of the information economy. They have the insider information. It's in the national objective to further the economy, they'll do it, if the risk is low. We know that US companies, 
provide internal information to US secret services to help them with that. So they give them access to the technical specifications, but also vulnerabilities that they have found in the proprietary software are given first to the US government, and then maybe eventually disclosed to us. Now, these companies that do this, they don't do this because they've been compelled, but because they get access to intelligence information in return. Now, this is again not, let's say, uh, about security or terrorism. This is about economic advantage for those companies. Again, we have seen this in the past. Echelon is a well-known example where they used a spy network to spy on European and German companies to find out business secrets and, well, destroy European business deals uh, and create patents and block entrance to markets for European companies abroad. The damage was estimated in 1988 already to be about $8 billion per year by the Max Planck Institute. So this is pretty serious numbers, uh, given that you, you know, we have a budget for research in Germany of about $2 billion a year on the federal level, so that's $8 billion in damages on that. Now, so how does the react? How does the European Union react to learning about prison? Well, they said direct access of U.S. law enforcement to the data of EU citizens on servers of U.S. companies should be excluded unless in clearly defined, exceptional, and judicially reviewable situations. Okay, so direct access. Okay, well, the NSA said the FBI is a proxy, so that's no longer direct access. Uh, clearly defined. Well, define it as always. That's clearly defined. Exceptional, well, we are doing the war on terror, it's all exceptional. And judicially reviewable, I'm sure you've heard about the FISA court approving everything always. So but they already satisfied that. Now, the US doesn't just limit itself to monitoring or exploiting zero day bugs, they also just directly control key internet infrastructure. So with IANA, they control number of resources for IP addresses, uh, the domain name system. Uh, uh, this is the root zone for all of our name resolutions, the DNSSEC root certificate, which is supposed to secure name resolution, uh, most of the X509 certificate authorities that are used to secure HTTPS transactions, um, as to say, let's say do serious business in the US, are headquartered there. And of course, most of the major browser vendors are also subjected to, to, US, to US jurisdiction, and they get to pick whose CAs get shipped with the browsers. Um, so you know they control these things as well. And this is our public key infrastructure that we're using every day on the web. And if that's compromised, just encrypting your sessions doesn't give you anything. Now, many of us, is there a political solution? And I'd like to remind you that when uh, uh, James Clapper was asked, you know, does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? This was in this March month where they collected, you know, billions of records on American citizens. He just said, no, sir. And that was to the US Oversight Committee that was supposed to control his work. So if the spies lie like that to their political oversight bodies, when our guys go over there and say, hey, please stop doing that, and they say, okay, we'll stop doing it. That's not a promise you can do much with, right? So really, uh, negotiating with the US and getting them to stop, by right, you know, having them say so, is not going to get us anywhere. Worse, in some sense, is that, of course, the EU has supported this in the past very aggressively. So there uh, was a report to the European Parliament from a European research body, which said that the EU has secretly agreed to set up an international telephone tapping network via a secret network of committees established under the third pillar of the Maastricht Treaty, covering cooperation on law and order. EU countries should agree on international deception standards to cooperate closely with the FBI. Right? Network and service providers in the EU will be obliged to install tappable systems and to place under surveillance any person or group when served interception order. So really, you know, the political solution may not even be wanted. We're spending literally billions of dollars on making our systems less secure these days. Now, given this, the question is, can we develop technologies and solve problems created by this kind of technology? Uh, first solution was deployed by the Chinese. They decided to hack back. Right? Um, not a great solution because it doesn't give you back civil liberty. It might give you back an edge 
uh, in terms of you know economics, but in terms of civil liberties, you don't get them back that way. Uh, one other great solution that was proposed was moving data into European cloud, right? Uh, well, the problem there is, first of all, you make yourself a very juicy target by having your data on some European center, so that this is what the NSA is going to hack next then. And secondly, as we have seen, we may not want to trust the Europeans with this to begin with. So our answer uh, has been to effectively decentralize data and trust, so we don't store it on some central location. We force them to hack effectively every single PC and that's hopefully something we can observe because the data is stored, our data is stored with us. And we do not trust some central entities or authorities with these things. When we try to decentralize everything, well, that really means we have to encrypt everything end to end. We have to decentralize our public key infrastructure as well. Decentralize how we store data, make sure we have no servers and no trusted authorities in the system. Now, it turns out that's really, really hard, but if we do that, we get no, make sure that there are no juicy targets for advanced persistent threats like the NSA. Now, what we do know is when we compare decentralized systems to centralized systems, well, the decentralized systems have a couple of disadvantages. They're typically slower, we don't have economics of scale, they're harder to use, harder to develop, harder to make secure, actually, harder to evolve. Uh, but compared to centralized systems, well, centralized systems we should think of as already compromised. Right, so it's you know, a bad choice, but uh, uh, certainly better than what we have right now. So the goal uh, of my research in Munich is essentially to make these decentralized systems faster, more scalable, easier to develop and deploy, easier to evolve and extend, and of course secure. The overall vision is, if, you know, this is a little abstraction of how the internet works these days. You know, physical layer, ethernet, you've hopefully all seen that, IP and routing. TCP, UDP, DNS, the PKI, and then applications on top, is to build a new network. Uh, we start with effectively everything that the old network gives us in terms of connectivity. So if we can talk with H over HTTPS with somebody else, we use that. If we can talk with TCP, we use that. But then we start to, uh, the first step is encrypt every link. Right? So whenever there was a physical connection between two participants, we encrypt that uh, using uh, ephemeral Diffie-Hellman and AES. Above that, we add a secure routing infrastructure, the distributed hash table. Um, on top of that, we then do end-to-end -end encryption. So I encrypt on every link and end-to-end. -end. So the link encryption means that a passive attacker can't see even what's going on in the links. And end-to-end -end means even if I have a malicious node on the path, he can't see what the data is that's being exchanged between the participants. Then we replace the naming system and the public key infrastructure with a system we call the GNU Alternative Domain System, which I'm going to talk about next. And then we have to just worry about how to build new applications on top of the whole thing. And that's what we call the GNU-NET system. Okay. So the first just challenge we have is to figure out how we're going to decentralize naming. So this is a Zuku's triangle. I hope you can kind of see it. Uh, Zuku uh, put forward a hypothesis. He says it's impossible to have three properties in a naming system. He says it's impossible to have global names. So everybody who asks for what is the meaning of a name gets the same value globally. Have memorable names, as in the names are short and things that we can remember, like, you know, piratenpartei.de is something I can remember if I have an 80-bit uh, uh, key that's just random bit sequence. I can't remember that so easily. And secure, which is, you know, uh, that the mapping can't be tampered with by a third party, uh, but also they don't have to trust any centralized authority to do the right thing here. He said all three things at the same time are impossible to achieve. So, but of course we would like to have all three. If you take the current domain name system that you're using when you normally use the internet today, uh, you're effectively using a system that is global and memorable. Right? So the names are globally mapping to the same kind of servers, and you can remember them easily. And uh, the DNSSEC system that is being deployed right now kind of uh, effectively tries to make that a bit more secure. Uh, so that's the arrow going up with certificates. Um, of course, it doesn't quite achieve security because in DNSSEC you're still relying on the root servers and the root certificate, which is owned and operated by well, mostly Americans. Now, uh, an alternative is a system that is global and secure. So here, uh, the main thing you might know is tors.onion 
namespace where you have a hash of a public key followed by dot onion and if you look that up well it's hard to memorize that hash code but it's a cryptographic binding so it's, you're guaranteed to be talking to the right entity and the names are global there's uh, another system secure and memorable so it's perfectly secure and you can remember the names but they're not global if you are a unix person you know etc hosts where you can specify any name for any resource in your local computer and that's valid for you the mapping is now stored in your local computer but other users can't use them and they might have completely different mappings if they uh, write their own etsy hosts file so here we have a system uh, that is secure and memorable but not global there is an extension of that idea uh, called satsi um, which is what our system is largely based on which says, okay, I, I might have these private mappings that are secure, but I'm making them available to everybody else. So other users can refer to my names. So if I have a name for Jake and you have a name for me, you can do jake.me, whatever my name is for you, and access uh, Jake's uh, sites, for example. So uh, we have a secure and memorable system that achieves this transitivity property on top of it. And we can, of course, combine multiple of these systems, so it's not like we can uh, only have one uh, solution. So what we do is we have both cryptographic identifiers and this transitive namespace in one system, and that's what we call the GATS system. So in GATS we have signed resource records. We can have this secure delegation where I can delegate a subdomain to some other user uh, with cryptography, of course, uh, and the resolution is decentralized using this uh, distributed hash table I mentioned before. And in the end, every user has to manage his own zone, and he doesn't have to trust anybody else to do resolution in that sense. So what does zone management look like? If you have ever done any DNS zone management, uh, this is a, you know exactly the same kind of thing where you say, okay, this is the name for the record, these are the values, this is the IP address of the server or whatever uh, uh, resource associated with the name, and you can just put that into your normal local machine the same way you would for, for DNS. Then uh, here's a simple example. Suppose Bob has a web server, so he would put into his zone www has an A record of 5678. Five, um, and here we put in a pseudonym that says he wants to be called Bob, and he signs this with his uh, public key. And once he has done this, he can, in his own, in his own machine, access his web server using www.gats. Right? And the point that there's .gats at the end effectively tells your machine, oh, I shouldn't use the DNS system, I should use the gats system. Then what he can do is he can print himself a little business card uh, and he puts in his public key on in this QR code and he can give that to his friends. And then when his friends uh, uh, import this public key, they can then resolve Bob's records using whatever name they gave for Bob. So for example, Alice might import Bob's public key into her zone. Right, so this is now Alice's zone. She says, okay, Bob, and here's Bob's public key. And once she's done this, she can put it to her web browser, you know, www.bob.gats, and she will get to Bob's website. And how does this happen? Well, when her browser tries to resolve bob.gats, it'll first look in Alice's zone, find out, okay, that's Bob is in, has the following zone for Bob, and then she will go into the DHT and find out, okay, who has a record for www uh, in, in Bob's zone, what's that record? And she gets back the correct answer. Once we have that, we can also use this to replace the X509 PKI. Because in these zones, we can put records that say, okay, this is Bob's SSL server certificate, and then secure it this way because the certificates uh, provide us a trust, a trust chain. So here's, for example, a, a website, uh, and this is an actual screenshot we did, where we put in a, 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 the website of the Internet Society in the GATS domain with the respective certificate, and the browser then was validating uh, uh, that the website was the correct website using the GAT system as opposed to using the X509 PKI. Okay, now this comes, uh, it's going to be a bit more technical now. <laughs> One of the things that you don't have in DNS is query privacy. So when you send a request out, everybody can see what you're asking for and they can learn everything about the response. So in our system, what you can do is you can send out a query and people will not learn what you were looking for. Right? Now, later when you use it to establish a connection, they might still learn if you don't use uh, some kind of other service like Unit or Tor to hide what you're doing. Um, 
but already in this system, we try to maximize the privacy of your queries. Uh, and this is also for the peers that participate in routing your query and resolving it. They should not be able to know what you are looking up. So what we use for this is it's called elliptic curve cryptography. So in elliptic curve cryptography, you have the first thing is called elliptic curve, uh, which consists of a couple of parameters. The most important ones are a generator, G, that's a point in a two-dimensional space. And uh, uh, that po uh, point generates a group, and the group has a size, and that's called N, and N is a prime number. You don't need to really understand this part. <laughs> now, given these two parameters, which are just you know fixed, everybody knows them, you start by creating a private key. So this is your secret for your zone, which is just a number, um, mod n for the mathematicians. So just a big number. And that's what we call x. So anybody who has x is allowed to put records into the zone. And everybody who doesn't have x must not be able to put records to the zone. OK, that's the secret that we each have. Then if I multiply x with g, I get another point. So x is just an integer, but I can multiply an integer with a point. I get another point, p. That's the public key. So if somebody wants to look up something in my zone, they have to somehow got my public key. That's what I put on this QR code. Okay? And the trick is, even if I know p and g, I cannot get calculate x. That's what's considered to be hard cryptographically. So next thing we have to have is a label for a record in the zone. So this is what the name I'm trying to look up, like www or Bob or Alice. Let's call that L. We represent it also as a number. And then when I do look up this name L in the zone for P, well, I get back a set of records, the answers, right? What's the IP address of the servers? What's the public key of uh, where I'm delegating to? Let's call those the records. So that's RPL. And now I'm going to look for these things using a query that I'm going to send out to the network. That's QPL. And what I'm going to get back is BPL, which is the encrypted information that nobody else is supposed to learn about. Okay. So now here's how it then actually works technically. So when I have uh, my label L and my public key P, I first hash these two together, standard normal hash function. I get a little H number. Then I calculate D, which is the label number times my secret number mod n. So this d is in some sense a new private key that I've derived from x and l. And then what I do is I take my records, rpl, I encrypt them using a key that I've derived from, uh, from l and p, I sign them using the secret d, right? standard public key copy. if I've got the private key I can sign with that, and I attach the public key which is d times g for the secret D. And I publish all of this under the query QPL, which is the hash of D times G. So the hash of this public key. Okay. Now if somebody wants to search for label L in zone P, he can also calculate the small h as hash of L and P. You know, these were the two parameters he had to know up front. Um, he can then calculate hash of L times P, so this is the point multiplication again, which happens to be the hash of L times G time, LXG, which is the same as HDG. This is just standard multiplication. Um, so you can compute what the query should have been, use that to get from the network the encrypted response, and you can decrypt it using again the same function uh, that we used for encryption before. Now what is interesting here is that if I do not know in which zone, which P, you're looking for which label, I can neither say what your query was for, nor can I decrypt the answer. Right? I have to know both. Exactly what name in which zone you're looking up, otherwise I will learn nothing from your query. So that's where we get query privacy in the system. Also, you can of course not put... Jake, you want to have a question? <laughs> You of all people should understand the map. I understand the map. The question is, uh, how do you make that assumption? Like, what if the label is with a certain set of bytes, and then like, you add the number that you know, how distinguishable are they? Like, are well, they? yes, you can have a guessing attack. If I you know, think, OK, I have Jake's public key for, for Jake's zone, right? and he might have a record www in there, then I can guess and do a confirmation attack. Right. Right? So on my, on my next slide, you'll see confirmation attack is still possible. 
Yeah, well, well, the, that was what I was going to ask. And then the second part is... But uh, you can, transport. for example, pick for your label a password. Or you can keep your public key for your zone, you know, not super visible. You can make any number of zones as you want. And then you can get good privacy on those things. Is it possible to have transport security as well so that an observer, even a bad observer in there, can have end-to-end -end query privacy and they'd have to break that first and then... Well, we, guess, we, we assume the attacker is already an active, active attacker in the GNU-Net network, okay. right, who, who is sitting on the wire. He's, you're the first guy, you know, you're, you're sending this query out, and I'm the first peer, right, that you're communicating with, and, you know, the end-to-end -end encryption was between the two of us already, right, but I'm the attacker, right? If, if you're outside, if you're a passive attacker on the normal internet, you won't, you know, you'll see there's a GNU-Net conversation going on, you don't even know it's GATS. Right? But this is for the peers in the network. So even if the guy has cached the response, he can verify the signature, he can provide me with the answer. You know, he is the guy who, who has the data, and so he couldn't tell what he gave me. Is it possible that you could create a kind of alpha mixing like query system where you could basically set up a long term session? I could connect to you through untrusted peers and resolve names that are individually encrypted to the session key that, that we have generated with some kind of Diffie Hellman. So that then, even if there's an evil peer that can't do or begin to do guessing attacks at all without having first broken the session key? Because if so, then you would have the same properties inside and outside of the network. And then it would be impossible for them to do a confirmation without having also done an active man in the middle attack, which you stopped with the QR code in the beginning, for example. That's, does that make sense? Not quite. Let's talk about it later. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> I mean, you, you can, you know, get anonymity on top of all of this, right? Okay. So, what are the properties we have here now? It's a fully decentralized name system. We can have secure memorable names. We can have global unique secure identifiers. We can use things like QR codes for introduction. Uh, we can use delegation to make the names that we put into the system more useful for others. Uh, we get this query and response privacy, except against the confirmation attack. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, and this can be then used to create an alternative PKI. We can use it to validate TLS records, right? whatever. And so in GNU-Net, we plan to use this for you know, file sharing applications, social networking applications. Uh, there are people working on doing this for voice over GNU-Net, where you need to identify who you're talking with. So all of these peer-to-peer -peer voice applications have this big problem that, okay, yeah, I can encrypt the session, but who do I know what the encryption key for the other party is? What's the public key infrastructure? And with this existing, you know, the Skype, you say, okay, I trust the Skype service. They know who the other guy is. He has been locked, locked in his username and password on Skype. And that's where your problems then come from. Here we don't need this. If you've got a chain of people that you know, okay, you know, Bob.Dave.Alice, and then, you know, via this chain, I can authenticate the user. Okay. Questions on the GATS part, I should say. More questions. What about deniability? Where's the microphone? What about deniability was the question. Uh, deniability of what? Uh, so imagine that since I've given out my key to you, and you verified it, and you want to ask me about the label in the zone, and I give you something, let's say, uh, another public key which I've generated just for you, so we can conspire together to overthrow some but government. You give me a sub subzone, first of all, right? You would say, here's the subzone that you know, I give you the key for. Yeah. So, and an attacker in the network records all that stuff. They've got, and they've got it all, and they want to do some confirmation. So they go to your house, and they beat you up, and they take your keys. Does it resist, say, like, in a week, in a month? the actual session information, will they be able to decrypt it? Will it be forward secret? And then the question is, if, if it is forward secret and they get you in the time window, do you have deniability in the sense that we talk about deniability and off the record messaging? Like for example, either of us could have generated that, uh, that data because we have a Mac okay. over okay. since First, first of all, in, in GATS, I, you don't have to be online for me to look up your records. Mm -hmm. So we can't have this, you know, uh, exactly the same thing that you would have in OTR messaging, where we both have a secret. Now what you do have on the GNU-Net encryption side is all, all of the keys are ephemeral. Right? So, so the link encryption and the end-to-end -end encryption GNU-Net is all ephemeral keys, uh, and both sides could fake either side of the key. Uh, but that doesn't apply it to the GATS record system, because there your public key that you put in your zone would be you know, the thing you put in your QR code. Well, we assume that that's kind of a long-term key. But of course you can say, okay, I'm going to create a subzone. Right, that has some other private key, and I can't prove that it was yours. Right, that this subzone belonged to you. Could have de delegated to a com completely different person, and I couldn't thereby then prove that uh, that was still you. 
So you could introduce ephemeral keys in that way, kind of, but not exactly in the OTR way. I mean, I, I imagine that since you're doing a key exchange with the person, you could do something at the same time to generate. Well, no, we don't do a key exchange with the person offering the records. Here. No, we're no, talking I mean, to the DHT. I mean, when you give a business card, that's the key. That's the the new key exchange, right? And so then the the question is. Is it possible that we could do something that would allow us to have some deniability and some ephemeral keying while also being authenticated such that, uh, I call this the, after Zuko, he suggested this to me, the Zeta cartel problem, right? So the Zeta cartel comes to your house and they say, we're gonna kill your family if you don't do what we say. So you do what they say, because you don't want them to kill your family. This is different than the state covering you and the legal stuff that comes with that. So when the Zeta cartel comes and they force you to give it up, what do they get? And it sounds like from right now... Right now they would get control of your zone, and they could do with your zone whatever they want, and they would know because they found the private key of your zone on your drive... That it's yours. That, that it's yours, unless you... Of course, you should have encrypted your drive, but as they're going to kill your family, you might decrypt your drive for them or something. Exactly. So it, it would be interesting to try to add some deniability stuff by default to this, such that when the Zeta cartel comes and you comply, they get nothing. And hopefully they still don't kill your family. <laughs> Okay, I, I don't quite see how to do that yet, especially since the two parties are not assumed to be online at the same time. I want you to be able to use names that I have for other people while I'm offline. Um, so that makes it really hard. But when we do the key exchange with the business cards, an interesting thing we could do is if we literally had devices, it wasn't just a piece of paper, we might be able to generate shared secrets that we then put um, into our zones or that we respond to that are unique. Well, you, you could always say that you have the label as a passport. If your label, which is the same kind of thing, is something that is not known, right? But the problem is if I confiscate your computer, I can see which records you might have on your system. I might be able to inspect the database. So what you'd have to do is you have to put something under that label into the DHT and then forget about it yourself. Yeah. And that, if you do that, then you're, I think, fine. But I just don't see this as what most people would do in practice. I, think, I, I mean, I tend to agree, but I think if we make it do it that by default, for example, then that's what most people will do. So if we make sure that deniability is a part of it, then it will be what everyone does. I mean, that's how OTR has been as successful as it is, I think. And it's also what makes Tor very secure, is that we have board secrecy and we found a way to automate that stuff. Yeah. Nobody would ask for it, um, but well, we did. I just don't think that if you have your naming system and public key infrastructure labels be kind of one-time use things, that that's going to be terribly popular. Yeah, that's true. It might be hard to convince people of that. Okay. So uh, the next problem is that we, when, we, when we build decentralized systems is that they tend to evolve, or we would like them to evolve, but evolution is hard. So if I add an extension to my decentralized system, I can expect that you know not all of the billions of users are going to upgrade in the same millisecond. Now if I'm you know Facebook, I can deploy my new version of the software on the website and everybody who hits it with their web browsers can download the JavaScript code immediately and update at the time of my choosing. In a decentralized system based on free software, I can't force everybody to update. I mean, even Microsoft can't assume that every Windows user is going to upgrade, you know, like Snap, the same millisecond. And now I've got this decentralized system where there are different versions of the software being deployed at the same time. So you've got clients who speak kind of new versions of the protocol and peers that speak older versions of the protocol in the same network. That creates for some fun, right? So the question is, how do we transition gracefully? And uh, how to do this gracefully, I have learned from Carlo. Uh, but let's start with what people have done before. Uh, so before, we have things like XML, which is a language that can support extensions. We've seen this with HTML, you know, one, two, three, four, five, I don't know how far they're going to count, uh, but the problem is it's syntactically I can make extensions, but the extensions are meaningless to older browsers. So HTML5 extensions will be meaningless to browsers that don't support HTML5. And what we would like to have is a system where extensions still have some meaning to older clients. So with uh, Psyche, we get that. So Psyche is a messaging protocol. Um, that's uh, you know has similar goals for messaging like what you might have seen as XML and JSON. Um, the main things of Psyche is, uh, are the peers exchange messages. A message consists of a state update and a method invocation. So state update you can think of maybe you have a social profile and you change your profile picture or your contact list or you have a, a messaging channel and you change the topic. The topic would be part of the state of the channel. And the method invocation is, you know, now I'm going to do something 
uh, uh, like send a message to all my members, write something on my wall, whatever. And um, other ideas from Psych that are relevant are things like uh, stateful multicast. So I'm multicasting these changes to all of the group members. So if I have a very large group, I don't have to be able to send it to each of you individually. I can have you cooperate in the distribution. I can look at the history, so I can look at what happened in the last five minutes. So when you log in, uh, you might like to see you know, the hist historic things that happened just before you joined. Um, and the updates to the state uh, are difference-based, so if the state becomes large, I can still do efficient updates by only sending the differences over the network. But as I said, the main thing of Psych is that it, it addresses this extensibility problem. We try to explain that. So, when you look at the psych state, it's structured. So it's key value pairs, um, but the names for the values have some structure. So for example, we have here name, name first, name first Chinese. And so when I make extensions, I might make an extension of supporting Chinese first names, but older clients will still say, oh, I understand name first. I'll just ignore the Chinese part. Or they may not understand you know, first and last names, but then they would see, oh, it's still a name. And so it still has some semantics for those clients. The same thing was also done with the method invocation. So when I get a message which invokes a method, uh, it has this structure, where it can be a message, can be a private message, a public message. And if I don't understand the very specific details, I'm going to the more, next more general class. So if you've done object-oriented programming, it's pretty much the same kind of idea, just in a message format here. And so this way, uh, if my application evolves, I can add more specializations. I can, you know, add new types of mess, uh, subtypes of messages, so to speak, or new substates, and older clients will understand them in their more general form. And they might not you know, apply the same kind of highlighting, the same kind of uh, very custom logic to them, but they might st still apply some very gen generic logic that handles those message types. And here's a little bit of code for how this would be implemented. Effectively, I have my uh, handler array of all of the things that I can handle, all of the messages I understand, and when I get a method, I first see, okay, is the exact method that's being asked for, do I know that one? If not, I remove the part after the unders last underscore and try again. I just try and slice. You try to match. If it doesn't match, you look for the next, next more generic mapping. Try again until you reach a top level handler. So the advantages of this is a very generic mechanism. It's extensive, can support many applications, so it's not tied to one particular application. Uh, the try and slice pattern can be applied to the state and the methods for looking up things. Um, and we now know what backwards compatible means here. If I introduce an extension where I just add a new underscore foo, right, then I know, okay, existing applications will interpret this without the specialization. If I introduce a new top level method that has different semantics, I know now I'm breaking backwards compatibility for all clients. They will not be able to understand it at all. Now there's a question. Uh, do, do you have a mechanism to uh, flag uh, certain sublevels as uh, critical, like is done, for example, in, in X509 certificates, uh, because otherwise an older client might take a message public whisper, think it's a message public, and put it on the front. No, page. it would. Yeah, it would still treat it as a message public because it doesn't understand the whisper part, yeah. right? But you, as a developer, know, right, that that's how the semantics are going to evolve. Right, you know that older clients that do not understand this new specialization will treat it as the respective parent. So I would prefer to define a message whisper or something in that exactly. case. Yes. You might, yes. So when we talk about psych, so the good things are it's a very compact encoding. Uh, we have the stateful multicast for supporting large groups of users. We have the message history, which is important for many social networking applications. And we have this extensible syntax and semantics. And so we are going to use this to build a social networking foundation together with the GAT system for the PKI, uh, where we push social profiles, so state to all the recipients. Uh, we don't use a federation. So you know all of these federated social networks like Diaspora, where you effectively still have a server that serves thousands of users that you have to trust. So here, the social data for you lives on your machine and the guys that you authorized as your friends, they will get the data that you authorized them for and that will be stored on their machines and nowhere else. Uh, the main way you will access 
the network is by replaying information from your local database. So you won't go and have to, you know, oh, I'm going to visit uh, Carlos' profile, let me talk to his peer. No, when he made a change, my peer was authorized to see it. It will be pushed to me, replicated on my machine, and therefore be able, well, available to me instantly, in particular also if he's offline. The main thing, as I said, is my data stored on my machine only, and of course, my data includes all the data people gave me access to explicitly. Questions on the well, psych side? Carl? Hmm? Do you have questions on psych? <laughs> no, I'm fine. I love, love your presentation. <laughs> What about the user experience? How do you get lots of people, like normal people, to use that thing? I mean, if I go to my mother or my godmother to use it, how do I explain that? Microphone. Don't use your grandmother as the example. That's rude. <laughs> That's women, rude. Women know how to use computers, too. Let's use the grandpa. Are you trying with some mic? I can use my grandpa. Same problem. You want to repeat your question? So my question was, what about the user experience of this software? Uh, if I want my uh, grandfather to use it, for example, uh, how can I explain him how to use this kind of thing? I mean, it's uh, because I think there is a value in opportunistic, opportunistic encryption in the, in the sense that everyone can, could encrypt that their messages and not only people who have something to hide. But uh, all this, all those things look really complicated for like the regular person to use. Well, you don't have to understand the math part as a user. But right. still, I mean, uh, you still have to install some obscure software on your computer to use that, uh, that software. Yes, now Carlo wants to answer that I'll question. Get that. <laughs> I'll get to that later. He wants to answer that question later. Okay, my answer to you is, of course, we need to worry about usability and making this very easy to use, and we are way far, far away from that. Uh, but I hope with uh, Jake's help, we will eventually be able to deploy routers to everybody where this is part of the standard set. Oh, sh I'm not, oh sorry, sorry. Not supposed to say that word. Uh, but well, this is effectively part of the default setup that you have, so that you wouldn't have to do the installation uh, all by yourself. I know too many things about Jake. Don't say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is, uh, again, a little bit technical thing, which is uh, if you want to do a search in a peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, for example, for a peer that offers a particular service, one of the very powerful ways that uh, Unix people know how to do search is regular expressions. Who here has heard about regular expressions before? Oh, good. <laughs> uh, we'll see an example a bit later. Super. Okay. So, essentially, me as the person offering something, I can specify uh, a set of strings that would correspond to what I'm offering as a regular expression. So when I'm a peer offering it, I build a regular expression that describes my service. And if there's a, what we call patron looking for peers offering a particular service, they have a search string right, that they will use to search those peers. And so uh, the question now is, how, how does the patron find the peer that, or the peers that offer a matching service? And so what we do is we start with uh, taking the regular expression, oops, sorry, compiling it to what's called a deterministic finite automaton, store that one in the DHT, and then the patron can search it. Now, let me give you a little example. <laughs> so here's a, a regular expression. It says A, B, or C, D. So any string that starts with either A, B, or C, D, then has, oops, has an E, or one, zero or more E, so it's E star means E, 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 whatever, and then one F. So any of those strings matches this particular regular expression. So when we take this regular expression, so we can convert this into a deterministic finite automaton. Sounds very complicated, but it's easy. Uh, you start at Q0, and that's the starting state. And then you take your string that you're trying to match, and you see, okay, it's labeled, see two edges, A and C. So if it starts with A, you go to the state A. If it starts with C, you go to the state C. If it doesn't start with either, well, we say we will not, we'll not find it. It doesn't match. Then if it follows with a B or a D, you go into this big state in the middle. If it then has an E, well, you keep where you are. And if it then has an F, you go to this last state, which has this double ring, which says, okay, you're there. And that's where kind of the peer would be that is offering the service. Okay, then we have an algorithm how we can map the states from this DFA into the DHT. And then if peers look for a string, they would effectively follow the chain of transitions in the DHT to the peers that offer the respective service. And we can show that 
uh, even if millions of peers do these offerings and searches, the data will be consistent. You will find exactly the peers that offered matching services and not anybody else. And that's a bit uh, technically on the complicated side to prove that that works. I'll skip over the details, right? So we implemented that and uh, uh, tried it on some interesting data set where peers were effectively saying, okay, uh, let's suppose I'm a Tor exit node and I'm offering exit services for these IP address ranges. Uh, that's my service description and then I'm looking for an exit that supports a particular IP address uh, as the search term. And uh, here's a little graph on how fast we can do the search uh, with a peer-to-peer -peer network with 100 milliseconds latency between the peers and how many uh, queries were successful after, I think in the end, 30 seconds, pretty much all of them were done. So this is a little bit of technically how we can do searches in peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, the latency it depends on the length of the string. And so based on the you know 30 seconds latency, you can see it's only suitable for applications that's a, that allow moderate latency. Yeah, so we plan to use this for network searches, discovery of services, and for things like topic-based subscriptions and messaging applications. So, after these technical things, uh, let me conclude. I think everybody has something to hide, and decentralization that is needed to make that happen creates plenty of challenges for research. I should stress that unlike Tor, uh, our project is not yet a dissident-ready product. Uh, do not try to do this at home unless you've compiled your own kernel. Uh, like Tor, uh, we are free software and help is welcome and needed. And uh, finally, we say we must decentralize or really risk to lose control of our lives. And uh, as economic and ecological pressures get bigger, the repression apparatus that is being built these days will be used against us. And now is a good chance to fix that. Thank you. More questions? Where's the microphone? It's coming. Hi. Um, just a, a short question um, about all the encryption going on on top of um, HTTP. So uh, if I'm doing something like voice over whatever that is, is it actually possible uh, with all the CPU that has to be used in order to encrypt and decrypt and so on? It turns out the CPU usage is really not a problem for voice applications. So that is so cheap these days, especially since what you have to do is all of the voice packets is really just symmetric cryptography. That is really, really, you know, less than a millisecond, you don't care. What you might care about is that you might have to go over multiple hops in the network to get to the target. So with the IP network, you might have a somewhat shorter path, and the latency on the IP network or even the overlay network is what you have to watch out for. Now, how well that works out depends, of course, a lot of who you're talking with. So if you're talking about 50 hops, you know, going to the US, to, then back to Great Britain, and then to Australia, yeah, it's going to be a problem. Uh, if you're talking within your community, where you have a nice little wireless mesh network, and you're two hops away, you know, it might be great and better than what you get these days with your ISP. So it depends a lot on the network topology, but the thing to worry about is not the cryptography, but the link latency and the number of links you have to traverse. And that's one of the things we can always, of course, opt try to optimize and try to do better at routing. Uh, again, one of these technical issues uh, that, that here was kind of glossed over with saying, you know, we use a DHT. But that's kind of where the magic would have to be for getting the latency down. It's not the crypto. Okay. Um, it seems to me that with the NSA collecting all of the data that they do, even if you use encryption, they can still tell that you have used encryption. So it seems to me that all they really need to do is just convince all the governments in the world to outlaw encryption wholesale. Well, and the French have done that already uh, with limited success. As far as I know, crypto, at least strong crypto, is illegal in France. I don't think the French like that or follow that rule so much. They stopped that rule in 1996. They, they, they stopped that rule already? Okay. Yes. But, uh, but again, you start outlawing crypto, you know, a lot of things will break these days. And, uh, Online banking. Well, and the French, hmm? and the French have. Yeah, then only outlaws will have crypto, is what Jake says. Uh, as I said, I don't think that's a very serious threat that I would have to worry about right now. And the French, 
And, and, and an interesting observation is that the French have turned uh, uh, increasingly to cryptography uh, um, once they had the three strike rule that uh, once you uh, were found uh, guilty of uh, some misdemeanors uh, for the third time, you, you uh, lost your internet access. Yeah, but I think really what we need to get is uh, get everybody to use crypto in the first place and not worry about crypto being illegal. And everybody using crypto doesn't help us much if the government has the keys, so we need a decentralized PKI. Small question. Just a quick comment then. Um, what we saw recently in Australia was that they uh, a move to make it illegal to not hand over the keys. So that if you you were caught using uh, caught caught being caught being suspicious somehow because you don't need yeah. to try very hard to do that, it, it then becomes an offence if you do not hand over the keys. And we yeah. we that, that's that's Jake's that. Zeta Cartel uh, uh, attack. Effectively, you're being compelled to hand over the keys, and you really have no choice but to do so. Um, and that's why on the link encryption and the end-to-end -end encryption, we use ephemeral keys. So in our case, after 12 hours, you don't have the keys anymore. But that's so you can't defense. hand over the past uh, <laughs> keys. But, but that's not, not a defense, apparently. I tried to argue that, and I will continue to argue that. Well, on the technical side, it's the best we can do. It's because we make it impossible for you to comply. And, you know, of course, you can say, well, what if the judge doesn't understand? <laughs> uh, but that's not something I can fix other than by trying to educate the judge. Uh, Jake wants to say something. So a few years ago, we designed a system called uh, Mutually Assured Information Destruction. <laughs> and it was a... Uh, um, it was basically a system where you could, it was the opposite of the rubber hose file system, right? Where the rubber hose file system, someone would torture you forever and you could give them some number of uh, passwords and eventually they would give up on torturing you. That was the theory. And Julian uh, Assange and Ralph Philip Weinman designed this protocol um, and they put it into a hard drive encryption program and they shipped it. And MADE was the response to that, which is you want to give an oppressive government one password and prove that you have given them the correct password, but you don't want the data that would be decrypted by that um, to uh, be useful to them, right? So you tell them the password is, fuck the police coming straight from the underground, they type it in, and then it says, yes, that's the right password, you've complied with the law. But then they can't do anything with it. Um, using GNUnet and a DHT and systems like that, we could build MADE in an afternoon, and then you could comply with that law but it, you wouldn't actually be able to decrypt the drive. So, so constructions like that become really simple and very easy to build with what Christian is talking about doing. Um, and I was told by a lawyer it will work exactly once. And so maybe that's you. <laughs> what do you mean it will work exactly once? As in, uh, as soon as you do something cute with the legal system, judges tend to, especially when legislators work with them, um, to change the law to make sure that when you think you are cute, you are actually just in prison. And um, they would make it so that you can't use systems where you can't comply in this way, and they would interpret it that way. This was the thought that the lawyer said. They'll just make using that kind of system itself illegal. Exactly. So you can do a cute technical hack, but if it subverts the, the general desire of the legislation or of the judges, then they would go after you for that. And. Uh, obstruction of justice is a generic charge they could throw at you for doing that. So it's very important that we actually re retain the right to remain silent, and especially against self-incriminating uh, pieces of evidence, like passwords and keys. But also having ephemeral keys means that you don't have data to give up when possible. And, and there's also very good technical reasons, aside from privacy, for ephemeral keys, because you can't be compromised two years from now and all of the data you have in the past is lost. And so it's much less likely that you know the use of ephemeral keys would be outlawed. At least I seriously hope that. Okay, Carlo. 